Philippians chapter 3, we're going to start there in the second verse as we uh, come back to our sermon series that we've called Deeper. Uh, last week, of course, we got to hear uh, an incredible sermon about how the, the path of the righteous shines brighter and brighter until the full light of day. And today we're coming back to this series called Deeper that several weeks ago we began. And it began with this basic premise that for every believer, for every Christian, whether you're a babe in the faith or whether you've been a, a Christian for, for decades, every single believer can go deeper in their walk with the Lord. And I believe that God has specific ways that He wants each one of us to go deeper and to go deeper in faith, to go deeper in love, to go deeper in knowledge in our relationship with Him. The Bible says that God's goal in all of our lives, God's will for all of us is to look more and more and more like Christ, to produce more and more and more fruit. So that if you have breath, which you do, if you can hear my voice, which you can, that means God is still doing a work in you. And so today, we're going to continue that series based on that premise. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 3, and, uh, and I'll be uh, just transparent with you up front. It's been a very interesting week in terms, of, in terms of where God has led with this sermon. And some kind of insider baseball for you, a lot of times when we uh, think about sermons and plan sermons, for instance, with this series, we talked about some different aspects, and usually we pr- plan ahead pretty far in advance. Uh, but this week, as we kind of considered the plan of what we wanted to preach this week and, and next week, as Jason and I talked about it, there was just something that was kind of unsettled in my heart, and, uh, and not in a bad way, or it was just kind of like, Lord, where do you want us to go? What, what do you want us to see? And, and I'm telling you this this morning, that where we're going today is something that I believe the Lord wants me to hear, and really, I'm preaching this sermon for my own benefit just as much as I am for anyone else's. And, uh, and here's why. Here's, been, here's what's kind of been on my mind this week. And I've shared this with you before, uh, but you've probably heard about the rise of the nuns. The rise of the nuns. It, the N-O-N-E-S. Not nuns like Catholic nuns, but the nuns is in the N-O-N-E-S. And uh, this is a, a group of people that sociologists and those who study these kind of things have been interested in for a while because the nuns are those who now claim they have no religious identification or affiliation. And here's the interesting thing about the nuns. Uh, For those who are millennials, which I'm right there in kind of that millennial age group, the the nuns are are growing by leaps and bounds among millennials. And and as I think about the nuns, I I know uh, people that come to mind. It's not just a statistic, but people that come to mind, people that I went to high school with, people who are in my family, those people that, listen, grew up in a church a lot like Heritage or churches that are a lot like Heritage, evangelical Bible-believing churches. They grew up hearing the gospel, they grew up going through the programs, but now as they reach into adulthood, many of those people are stepping away from the faith. They are now saying, we no longer have any religious association or affiliation. Maybe we grew up in church, maybe we went to VBS, maybe we went to youth camp, and maybe we even made a profession of faith to some degree, but now we are walking away from the faith. And and the fastest growing religious group, you may or may not know this, the fastest growing religious group in this country is the nuns those who have no religious affiliation. And, uh, and the nuns have been in my heart for a long time. As I said, many of these people are my friends, these people I, I love and care about, and I still get to talk to them, which is great. Uh, but I've, I've often wondered, why is it? Why is it that, that people are leaving churches in droves? And why is it especially that young people who grew up in churches are coming into adulthood and coming to the conclusion I really don't want to have anything to do with that anymore. Why is it? And I present that to you so that you can kind of know the questions that are churning in my heart as I come to the text. And as I think about this idea of going deeper and, and, and thinking, trying to understand why is it that these things are happening. Now, here's, I, I'm going to give you, give you a couple of uh, possibilities up front. Like I said, I still get to talk to these people fairly often because many of them are my friends. In the last month or two, I've got to sit down with a couple of different friends. And here are some of the things that they tell me. These are people who walk away from the faith. Some of them would call themselves agnostic, atheist, all kinds of different different things, that, that, you know, they say this. They say, first they say, you know, Tim, there's all kinds of problems with the Bible. And they'll try and say, there's this problem with the Bible. It was written by men. There's all kinds of errors and contradictions in these things. 
and they'll say, you know, Tim, there's problems with the Bible. Well, then we'll sit and we'll talk about the issues that they have with the Bible, the manuscript tradition, the evidence that we have of the Bible's veracity and the confidence that we have in the Scriptures. And we'll kind of address those issues. And then usually the conversation turns from the Bible to, well, we can't really know. I mean, we can't know that Jesus rose from the dead. We can't know that Christianity is true. Uh, we can't know, especially not to the same degree that we can know, say, 2 plus 2 equals 4, the same way that we can perform scientific experiments. And so we'll, we'll talk about that, and then I'll, I'll try and kind of present the reasons of the evidence that we have for the Christian faith and the resurrection and, and the historical evidence that we have, and, and, and we'll talk about those things, and what inevitably happens, the pattern is this, that we'll talk about things like the Bible, we'll talk about things like science, or we'll talk about things like how we know, and, and then once we kind of address those issues, once those things are sort of uh, 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 addressed in their minds, inevitably it will come down to something else, and, and I'm just telling you, this is what I've been wrestling with. My sense is this, that once you get past the service, there's something there, there's some kind of an objection there, there's some kind of, of, of just, just problem there that the, the friends that I've talked to, they, they can't even say it. I'm not even sure they can articulate it, but I've, I've tried to, to think, what is the real issue? I don't believe that the issue is the Bible. I don't believe that the in issue is intellectual, and, and there are two conclusions that I've come to. The two conclusions are this, that one of the biggest issues as to why the nuns are walking away and why many people reject Christianity is an issue of the heart. We know this, that if Christianity is true, if, if nothing else, if Christianity is true, that means that God makes certain demands on our life. If truly Christianity is right and we are going to be followers of Jesus, then to follow Jesus means that we have to walk the narrow way. And I think there is a sense in which people who love their freedom and love that autonomy in their lives, they don't want anyone to tell them what to do. I think that's number one, but I think number two is this, and this is where we're going today. This is where we're going to look at Philippians 3. I think the second thing is, is that for many of those people who have chosen to walk away from the faith, they have chosen to walk away because the faith that they knew, the faith that they were taught was so shallow that in the end, they say, if that's what Christianity is, then what's the point? I'll be saved from hell if I pray a prayer. But other than that, kind of do your own thing. And we'll all end up in the same place for those who believe. I think that there is something that is intuitive. In fact, I don't think it's just intuitive. I think that there's something that's ingrained deeply in the souls of people that realize that if all Christianity is, is a way to get out of hell, then there's nothing really there. And, and I, I want to I be clear and honest up front, and I'm telling you, I mean this. I am preaching this to myself. I'm trying to wrestle through these things as I seek to love those people that don't know the Lord. But I, I really believe, it, it's not that the gospel wasn't preached in churches of, of people growing up who believe these things. It's not that, that, that they didn't hear the message that they're sinners and Christ is a Savior. It's just the fact that... That, that the gospel was so diluted and so watered down with so many other appendages, it basically became, okay, live a life in a nice, comfortable American setting where you have basically everything you want, tag on Jesus to the end of it, and guess what? You get to have a great life now, and when you die, you get to go to heaven. And as, as appealing as that might seem to one level, I think there's something deep in our hearts that says, is that it? And if that's it, listen, I'm not so sure I need this Christianity thing. I'm definitely not sure I'd need a Christ who, yeah, I know he wants me to go to heaven. but And I, as I think about these things, the Lord brings me back to this text in Philippians chapter 3. And I want to look at it today, and I, and I want to look at it as a way to try to answer this question. What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? After all is said and done, we talk about the Bible, we talk about how do we know. What, is it, what does it mean to truly follow after Jesus? And this text, I, I think, helps answer that question. And I want to I come to it looking for an answer this morning for myself. And if you're in the same kind of spot, for you too. 
And I want to start by looking at uh, chapter 3, verse 2. Before we do, just, just as a backdrop, Paul is writing this letter to the Philippians. The Philippian church uh, were known to Paul. Paul is writing from prison. And here's basically what's happened. The Philippian church writes to Paul who's in prison, and they write a letter to Paul saying, Paul, is there anything we can help you with? We know you're in prison. We know you have needs. Is there anything we can do for you? At which point Paul responds to them and says, listen, there's not really much you can do for me, but let me write you this letter about rejoicing in the Lord despite your circumstances. Let me remind you of the grace of God. Let let me remind you of the glory of Christ. And Paul takes the opportunity, and I love it, because they say, Paul, do you need anything? He says, no, here's a letter to help you with the needs that you have. That's the heart of the apostle of the Gentiles as he's in prison. But he writes this in in chapter 3. He says in verse 2, to the Philippians, watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision, the ones who worship by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh. Now let's pause right there and unpack a little bit of what's going on. Uh, throughout Paul's career as a missionary, as a church planner, as a pastor, he had to deal with an issue that came up over and over again. And the issue was this. How should New Testament believers, how should Gentiles relate to the law of God that we find in the Old Testament, the law of Moses? And the question was, you know, for us, we don't think in those terms, but for them it was incredibly important. Why? Because Christianity was birthed out of Judaism. And the question they had is, if you become a believer, especially if you're a Gentile, not a Jewish person who becomes a believer, do you then have to follow all of the laws that God gave to Moses? And so here's what Paul is saying in in Philippians chapter 3. He says this in other places, Galatians and Romans and other places as well. He's saying, no, if you come to have faith in Christ, that faith in Christ is what saves you. You do not have to follow the law. You do not have to be circumcised. And listen, uh, by the way, circumcision is a, is a controversial thing even today. If, if you don't know that, find someone, find a mom who has a young child and, and ask them what they think. If you dare, right? Okay. Uh, I've been, been on a few too many Facebook groups and don't look for pictures. Okay. Just take my word for it. All right. But circumcision is a controversial thing today. But in their day, circumcision was incredibly important. Because if you are a Jewish person, God commanded in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis, He said to Abraham, everyone in your house must be circumcised. And so for the Jewish people, it was incredibly important. If you were going to follow the Jewish God, you had to follow His command to be circumcised. But here's the thing. Paul, right here from the very beginning of chapter 3, he says, watch out for the dogs. Watch out for those evil workers who mutilate the flesh. In other words, the people who say that you have to be circumcised to be saved. The people who say that you have to follow the law of Moses. They don't understand that Jesus came to fulfill the law and we are no longer under the age of the law. And he he bears this out in other places, but he's saying to them, be warned. There are people out there who want to manipulate you. There are people out there who want to use you, who try to add something on to the gospel and say, not only do you have to trust in Jesus, but you have to do X, Y, and Z in order to earn favor with God. He says, don't listen to those people. Ephesians chapter 2, you are saved by grace through faith, not by works. It is the gift of God so that no one can boast. And he says there in verse 3, we are the circumcision. Not those who are circumcised in the flesh, but we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who do not put confidence in the flesh. This is Paul laying out the gospel, saying, do not forget, there is nothing that you can do to add to the finished work of Christ. But then he goes on. He says, don't put confidence in the flesh, although, he says in verse 4, I have reasons for confidence in the flesh. Now, think about this for a moment. This is the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul, uh, uh, if anyone had reason to brag about the works that God had done through them, wouldn't it be Paul? I mean, after all, Paul is, is, is the person perhaps in all of Christian history who is most used by God to share the gospel. 
He literally, we would not be sitting here today. It's very probable. We would not be sitting here today if it were not for the Apostle Paul. He took the gospel to the ends of the earth. His desire was to take it to where the gospel had not yet been named. And he planted church after church after church, proclaiming the gospel at risk of his own life over and over again until the day that he died. The Apostle Paul is an impressive person. But look at what Paul says. He says, although I have reasons for confidence in the flesh, I'm not putting any confidence in the flesh. And he invites us to compare his life to anyone else's. He says, if anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Oh, really? You have more? Well, what are they? Well, let's look. Verse 5, circumcised on the eighth day. There's circumcision again, right? And this is interesting because Paul here is claiming a pedigree. Let me ask you this. What eight-day-old boy chooses to be circumcised? The answer to that is none, right? They don't choose it. Their parents have to choose it. So what is Paul claiming here? He's not even claiming something about himself. He's claiming something about his family. He's saying, I grew up in the kind of family that took the law of God seriously. My parents were Jewish people. They had me circumcised. I was raised in a home where following the law of God was of paramount importance. I was part, I was set aside, circumcised on the eighth day. Then he says this, of the nation of Israel. And listen, Paul was proud of his nationality. Paul was an Israelite. He was a son of the promise. He was a physical descendant of Abraham, and he was proud to be a part of the nation of Israel. But he says this, not only that is he part of the nation of Israel, but he says of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, many of you know there were 12 tribes of Israel. There were 12 sons that Jacob had that turned into the 12 tribes. And it was important. If you were a Jewish person, it was important for you to know, what tribe am I from? Why? Because that tribe was your lineage. It was your history. It was your legacy. And here's what Paul is saying. He says, other Jews, they may have forgotten their history. They may have forgotten their lineage. They may have forgotten where they came from, but I have not. I am of the nation of Israel. I am of the tribe of Benjamin. I know my history. I know my legacy. I'm proud of it. He goes on to say, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. And scholars debate as to exactly what this means. Many scholars believe this is Paul saying, not only am I a Jew, but I am a Jew who knows the Scriptures. I have learned the Hebrew language. I know what the Scriptures say. Unlike other Jews who kind of take people's word for it, I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. I know what the law says. And it goes on. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. And he says, regarding the law, a Pharisee. Now, when we hear the word Pharisee, we immediately think hypocrite, right? If you call someone a Pharisee, they'll they'll take it as an insult. Why? Because we've so... so, uh, tailored our minds and we've so programmed our minds to think that way. But in Paul's day, it was exactly the opposite. For someone to be labeled a Pharisee meant that they were a people who kept the law meticulously. The Pharisees were people who, this is what the Pharisees did. They said, here's the law of Moses. And as part of the law of Moses, there's the part that everyone has to follow. And then there's a part that only priests have to follow. And you know what the Pharisees did? They said, listen, we know that we're ordinary people. We're not priests. But we're going to go beyond. We're going to even follow the laws that the priests have to follow to set ourselves apart. Paul says, with regard to zeal for the law, I was a Pharisee. I did it all. Regarding zeal, he said, persecuting the church. This is Paul saying, I was willing to go to any length to follow God. God, if you tell me to go and throw people in jail, I will throw people in jail. If you tell me to go to the ends of the earth, I'll go to the ends of the earth. He's saying, I would do anything to serve God because my heart was for Him. Persecuting the church, following the law. And then he says this in kind of a summary statement in verse 6. It says, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, I was blameless. It's an astounding statement, isn't it? And yet Paul was willing to say, when it came to the works of the flesh, when it came to following the letter of the law, I followed it perfectly. If anyone else has reason to boast, if anyone else has reason for confidence in the flesh, Paul says, I have more. And this is what makes the next statement so amazing. Let's read it together in verse 7. But everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss 
because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of Him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung so that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but the one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I don't want you to miss what Paul is doing. Paul here is inviting us to make a comparison. He puts on one side of the scale his nation, his nationality. He puts on that same side of the scale his family. He puts on that same side of the scale his education, all of his earthly achievements. He says, I look at my family, my nation, my pedigree, my legacy, and you weigh it all together. And he says, when I compare it to knowing Christ... All of that is dung. You see, for Paul, knowing Christ wasn't just about going to heaven when you die. For Paul, knowing Christ was making Christ the treasure, the purpose, the aim, everything in his heart was was fixated on Jesus. For him, everything else. And I want you to think about this. Listen, do you love your country? I love my country. I'm thankful to be an American. I'm thankful because we have beliefs and ideals that I believe are right and true. I believe that people have an opportunity to be able to rise up. And listen, we have an imperfect history, but I believe that those ideals are worth preserving in terms of our country and its future. I love my country, but listen, Paul said, I love my country too. But when I compare love for my country to Christ, it's done. Or listen, what about love for family? Do you love your family? Man, I love my wife. I love my kids. But according to Paul, he looks at his family, he looks at his history, and he says, listen, if I have to choose between knowing my family and knowing Christ, one is dung and the other is life. Or what about credentials or awards or education or accomplishments? He says, listen, all of those things, anything that you can stack on this side of the scale, I count it as loss in view of knowing Christ. And what does he say? He says, the surpassing value of knowing Christ. That I compare it all and I look at Christ and say, you are my treasure. You are my pursuit. You are my purpose. And I can't help but wonder, maybe resonating in the heart of Paul was a parable that Jesus told. Jesus said this parable in the book of Matthew. He says, the kingdom of God is like a treasure that's hidden in a field. He says, a man found the treasure hidden in the field, and he went and he sold all that he had in order to buy that field. And you know what? He did it with joy. Or Jesus tells another parable that the kingdom of heaven is like a pearl of great price, that a man who collected pearls all of his life, he knew their value, he knew their worth, he sold everything he owned in order to purchase that one pearl of greatest value. Here's what Paul is saying, that when it comes to life, when it comes to the blessings of this life, he counts them all dung in view of knowing Jesus. And as I think about those those are my friends who I believe are searching, who are longing, who are looking for something to fulfill them, it's all I can do to not say, do you not see? It's Christ that will fulfill your deepest needs. It's Christ who will fulfill your greatest longing. There's nothing else. There's nothing else that will fill your heart. There's nothing else that will satisfy your cravings. Christ and Christ alone. But here's what I'm afraid happens. Instead of believing that Christ is enough, instead of preaching that Christ is enough, we try to, we try to supplement. Well, let's, let's talk about Christ, but let's also talk about these other things. And, and, and let's, let's try to make Christ more attractive and let's make, try to make it flashy and good. And, and, add, and I'm just like, wait a minute. At what point was Christ not enough? At what point did we hand over Christianity to marketing schemes to try to get people to come in? And listen, this is something that I so believe to be true. I believe that those nuns, those millions and millions of people who are walking away from the church, I believe they are walking away because they tasted something. And maybe there was part of the flavor that thought, "Mm, this is good, but there was something in there that they knew was not. And I really believe it's not that they've rejected Christ. 
It's they've, re- they've rejected this projection of Christ that comes with all of the add-ons. Oh, let's have Christ in all of the flash. Let's have Christ in all of the show. Let's have Christ in some kind of charismatic figure who's going to make it all make sense. Listen, we don't need a charismatic figure to make it make sense. We don't need to erect a model or an image in our own making of someone that we can look at. We need Jesus. He is enough. The Bible says that when Christ is lifted high, He will draw all men to Himself. And here's what I love about Paul. Is that Paul didn't just say, oh, I'll count all things lost so that I'll have Jesus in my heart. No, Paul said, I count all things lost so that I may know Him. And listen, that, that, don't miss that, that idea of knowing, that intimacy. And you might think, well, wait a minute, Paul. You know Jesus. I mean, after all, Paul saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. He, he conversed with Jesus. The Bible teaches that Paul uh, got to see Jesus many times in different dreams and revelations. And yet, Paul says, I want to know him more. I refuse to be satisfied with the level of intimacy I have right now. I want to know him more. I want to know him more. I want to know him more. And look at what it says. He says in verse 10, My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. You see, this is what Paul knew. If Christianity was true, then it demands everything. Whether it calls us to go through suffering and pain and loss, if Christianity is true, then guess what? In the end, All of it, he says in 2 Corinthians, is but a light and momentary affliction. And I don't want to, I don't want to paint a pretty picture of Paul. You know what Paul says in 2 Corinthians? That there were times he despaired of life. There were times he was perplexed and confused and he didn't understand. But there was never a moment when Paul questioned whether or not Christ was enough. And this is my fear. It's my fear for myself. It's my fear for you. It's my fear for our, our, the state of our church as a country is that we try to add so much. We try to supplement. Oh, it's Christ and. It's Christ and. It's Christ and. We may know that our works don't save us, but we try to add all of this glamour, all of this gloss instead of preaching Christ and Him crucified. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and following, he says, we didn't preach Christ to you with fancy words. We weren't trying to manipulate you. We weren't trying to pull on your heartstrings to lead you down some kind of predisposed path. No, we preach Christ and Him crucified. And yes, it's a stumbling block. Why? Because if you want to follow Christ, you've got to admit, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I need your grace. But listen, any other Christ is no Christ at all. Christ did not come and die for our sins so that He could be an add-on. Christ did not come and die for our sins so that He could be a part. Christ came so that He could be our all in all. Christ came so that He would be the treasure of our hearts. And listen, when Christ comes, He says, if you follow Me, listen, My burden is easy. My yoke is light. He's not coming to pound us. He's coming to redeem us. He's not coming to laugh at us in the pit. He's coming to lift us out of the pit. But when we get out of that pit... Why do so many of us try to keep going back and back and back? Paul says, I want to know even the fellowship of his sufferings. That even if following Christ leads to death, I would rather have death with Christ than life without him. And after all, what, what is driving Paul? Why is Paul? What, what was the fuel that allowed him to go to church after church after church? What was the fire in him that allowed to, after he was stoned at Lystra and Derby, go right back into town? What was, what was the motivating factor in Paul's amazing accomplishments? Listen, it was not so that Paul would boast in, in himself, but it's so others would boast in Christ. He says in Galatians 6, May I never boast except in the cross of Jesus Christ, through which the world was crucified to me and I to the world. Listen, Paul did not want anyone to be impressed with Paul. Paul wanted to, in every moment, point people to Jesus. 
And listen, we live in a day and an age that likes to erect people for us to follow. We like to elect strong man leaders. We like to erect, we like to erect people that we think, oh, if I could just follow them. It's true in politics. It's true with pastors. It's true in every area of life. We like people that we think, ah, I can follow after them. But here's the problem with that. There is no one worthy to follow other than Jesus. And this is something that that for you, for me, listen, I have people that I look up to. I have people whose opinions I care about. I have people in my life who I love them and I would love to shape my life after them. But at the end of the day, if I place too much weight on a human being, I will be disappointed. And you may know this, there's kind of an ongoing controversy in, in our country today. You know this about, about whose statue should and should not be erected and left up. And listen, I'm not about to get political on you, but I, I love the conversation I had with a friend of mine the other day. This friend is a student of history, and we were talking about, you know, some people rioting and tearing down statues. And, uh, and of course, I don't believe in rioting. I don't believe statues should be torn down. Uh, but I love what this friend said. He said, Tim, you know what the real problem is? I said, no, what's the real problem? He said, the problem is, is that there is no man or woman who is ever worthy of having a statue in the first place. And I thought, you know what? That's true. Because the greatest human models that we have, the greatest examples pale in comparison to Christ. And listen, when Christ returns, we're not going to go to statues and think, oh, look at these great men. You know why? Because we're going to have Jesus. Our hearts are going to be set on Him. And He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. We're not going to need these models to inspire us. Why? Because we are going to have Jesus. And in this world, never forget, church, that in this world, we are exiles. We are pilgrims who are passing through. It says in Hebrews chapter 11 that we are to be people of whom the world is not worthy. This world is not our home. As much as we love these things that are temporary, they will not last forever. Which is why Paul said, I want to know Him. I want to follow follow Him. I don't want the adornments. I don't want the trapments. I don't want all the other things that, that in the end make Christ look small. I want Christ Himself. Does that mean that we don't love our country? No. Does that mean that we don't love our family? No. Does that mean that we don't seek to do things for the Lord? No. But it means at the end of the day, There needs to be something in us that says, Christ alone is my treasure. That I love my family, but my love for Christ is deeper. That I love my country, but my love for Christ is deeper. Paul said, I've considered all things lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. which raises a really simple question for me and for all of us. Is Christ the treasure of your heart? Not just, listen, not just for salvation, not just for going to heaven, but is Christ your treasure? Is Christ that pearl of great price that you would sell everything for if it just meant having Him? Is Christ that treasure in the field that you would go sell all you have so you could buy the field? And listen, enjoy. Follow after Jesus. I don't want a counterfeit. I don't want a watered down version. I don't want a substitute. I don't want a strong man that's supposed to be the mediated between me and God I want to know him and the amazing thing is Jesus wants to be known Jesus came from heaven to earth so that we could have a relationship with him Jesus is there for us to know and listen to go deeper and deeper and deeper and so today maybe you do know him Maybe you've known him for a long time, but here's what I want to tell you. He wants to know you more. He wants to be known more by you. He wants you to look less at the things of the world and more at him. 
Look at what Paul says in verse 12. Not that I have already reached the goal or am already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it. Look at that. I make every effort to take a hold of it because I have also been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Paul says in his letter to Timothy, I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he is able to guard that which I've entrusted to him for that day. Paul said, I will be satisfied with nothing less than a living relationship with the maker of the world. In which case I wonder, why are we satisfied with so much less? I can't help but wonder with those nuns, if they aren't rejecting a form of Christianity, they didn't have Christ as the treasure. There are many things in this world that seek our attention and devotion and affection. But can I ask you a question this morning? Can any of those things satisfy like Christ? Can any of those things offer you peace and life and joy and comfort? In the midst of suffering, in the valleys and the mountains, everywhere in between, is there anything like Christ? Of course, the answer is no, but do we live like that's true? Do we live like that's true? Church, I pray that we will live like that's true. And that we would truly believe that knowing Christ far surpasses everything else. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Do we believe it? Not that Christ is an add-on, but is Christ everything to us? I pray that he is. Let's pray.